Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you all. Let me do a quick uh, topper before I go to your questions. With about two weeks left to pass a spending bill uh, and avoid a second government shutdown in two years, uh, Republicans in Congress have shown no interest in taking Democrats up on their offer to join them at the table to negotiate a budget that keeps the government open and prevents irrational cuts to our economy and our national security. Uh, but instead of working with Democrats to find common ground on a budget that invests in the priorities of middle-class Americans, uh, House Republicans uh, are promoting a plan uh, to eliminate access to health care for families across the country uh, and shut down the government. Uh, this is a strategy, uh, I would note, that was supported by uh, a preponderance uh, of the Republican presidential candidates uh, at the Reagan Library last night. Unfortunately, however, the story gets even worse. Uh, today, House Republicans are proposing to make permanent cuts, permanent tax cuts for the wealthy and well-connected uh, without offering any relief to working families. Today, House Republicans are considering a measure uh, that would um, offer permanent tax cuts for corporations and businesses to the tune of $400 billion. Now, to put that in perspective, that's a lot of money. Uh, in fact, it's so much money uh, that the tax cuts that Republicans are advancing cost five times what it would cost to replace the sequester for the coming year uh, and would prevent automatic budget cuts that would harm our economy and military readiness. Uh, alternatively, uh, while Congress has failed to adequately invest in infrastructure, the tax cuts that Republicans uh, are advancing today are four times larger, four times larger than the six-year shortfall of the Highway Trust Fund. So this is money that could be uh, used to make a substantial investment in our infrastructure. Uh, I've got one way to quantify this for you. The tax cuts that Republicans are advancing cost twice as much as making permanent vital tax credits for about 25 million working families and students. Uh, and this is something that Republicans have uh, failed to act uh, to prevent from expiring. So the bottom line here is that instead of giving away hundreds of billions of dollars of corporate tax cuts, uh, Republicans should actually do their most basic job, uh, first and foremost, and that's uh, fund the government uh, at levels that are consistent with our economic and national security priorities. They should do that on time. Uh, and then if they want to have a conversation about taxes, uh, we need to make sure that uh, middle class families aren't left out uh, the way uh, they are uh, right now in this current uh, Republican discussion. So uh, with that, Darlene, let's go to questions. Uh, what is the objective of the President's meeting with uh, Reid and Pelosi this afternoon? Darlene, this is an opportunity for the President to sit down with uh, the Democratic leader in the House of Representatives uh, and the Democratic leader of the United States Senate uh, to talk about a range of priorities for the fall. Uh, it won't surprise you to hear that at the top of their agenda is, is a discussion about uh, what I was just highlighting, uh, which is the need for Congress uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, to pass legislation that would prevent the government from shutting down, but also making sure that adequate investments in our uh, economy and national security uh, are made. Uh, there is a shared priority uh, among Democrats uh, about the urgency of this issue. Uh, we have uh, said for some time that a solution will be yielded from a process that starts with the Republicans in Congress sitting down to negotiate with Democrats in Congress. Uh, we've been quite candid, and I don't think anybody's been surprised, uh, that the administration would be uh, supportive of those kinds of conversations. But at the same time, uh, we're going to be sitting on the same side of the table as uh, Democrats in Congress because they share our values when it comes to making sure that uh, our top priority is the safety and security of the American people uh, and doing everything we can to expand economic opportunity for the middle class. Uh, those are our priorities. They should be reflected in the budget, uh, and we certainly are supportive of uh, the invitation that Democrats in the House and Senate have extended to Republicans in the House and Senate uh, to sit down and, and talk this through. Uh, so you know, this will be an opportunity for the, uh, for the President to discuss uh, that effort with uh, Leader Reid and Leader Pelosi this afternoon. Should he sit down also with Speaker Boehner and Leader McConnell at some point? Do you anticipate that he'll do that? And why is he only meeting with Reid and Pelosi today and not the Republicans? Today? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think to answer the question very directly is, Republicans in Congress should be negotiating with Democrats in Congress. Uh, that has been a, the, the principle that we have uh, um, supported for quite some time, principally because it is the path to success. 
In 2013, the last time that we faced a budget showdown like this, uh, Republicans did engineer a successful shutdown of the federal government for two and a half weeks. Uh, when that shutdown was resolved, uh, the long-term budget agreement was generated uh, through conversations between leading Democrats and leading Republicans in the Congress. Uh, and that resulted in a bipartisan bill uh, that, for most of the last two years, has allowed us to enjoy some uh, an, an end to the budgetary brinksmanship uh, that Republicans seem to salivate over. Uh, so we'd like to see another agreement like that one. Uh, that previous agreement was reached uh, based on negotiations between Democrats and Republicans in Congress, and, uh, and we believe that's how it should be resolved this time. That said, I wouldn't rule out uh, future uh, conversations between uh, the President and some Republicans in Congress, uh, including the Republican leaders. Uh, but at this point, uh, the next conversation that needs to occur is between Democrats and Republicans in the Congress. Democrats are ready for that conversation, but uh, Republicans have rebuffed those overtures for months. Um, switching topics, the House Energy Committee passed a bill today to uh, end the ban on oil exports, and I know you said the White House doesn't support that legislation. Now that it's starting to move through the process, I mean, can you say whether that's something the President would veto if it ends up getting to his desk? Because there is a lot of support for it in the House of Congress. Well, I, I don't have a, a specific veto threat to offer at this point, but uh, our position on this, beer, on this bill is crystal clear. Thanks, Josh. Uh, the Syrian Air Force has launched an air, an air campaign against Islamic State health city of Raqqa. Um, and is there any kind of coordination between the U.S.-led coalition against the Islamic mm -hmm. State and the Assad government uh, when they have a, a shared goal here? Well, uh, Julia, we have made clear uh, from the beginning of our um, actions inside of Syria uh, that it was you know, the responsibility of the Syrian government to not interfere uh, in our activities. Uh, the fact is the United States uh, and our coalition partners hold the Assad regime responsible uh, for the dramatic growth that we've seen in ISIL uh, over the last year and a half or so. It's because of Bashar al-Assad's failed leadership inside of Syria that that nation has ruptured uh, and created an opportunity for extremists of a variety of flavors uh, to establish a, uh, a, a foothold uh, in Syria. No one has been able to uh, as successfully exploit that opening uh, as the extremists in ISIL. Uh, so the, we believe the thing that would do the most to advance our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL uh, is for Assad to leave power so that we can see the kind of political leadership inside of Syria that would restore at least some semblance of stability to that country. Uh, that would make it much more difficult for uh, ISIL to operate and would enhance our efforts to uh, degrade and ultimately destroy them. Right, but is there any kind of communication even through a third country when you have um, two different parties carrying out an air campaign on the same force in the same city. Is there any kind of communication, perhaps through an, another party? Well, I don't have any uh, specific conversations to tell you about, other than the, the kinds of conversations that date back to uh, the very beginning of our uh, military airstrikes, or this military air campaign uh, that began in Syria a little over a year ago now. Uh, at that point, um, the United States and our coalition partners made clear to the Syrians that they shouldn't interfere in those efforts, and uh, they haven't. Uh, I know that you and the president have declined to really weigh in on uh, last night's debate, but I did notice that the White House put out um, three statements right at the beginning of the uh, second primetime debate. Um, two were veto threats on Planned Parenthood and um, a new process for approving projects. Another was an opposition to a Lawsuit Abuse Reduction Act. Was that at all timed to um, have the White House view out there at the same time as the debates, specifically the one about Planned Parenthood? Uh, it was not. Uh, I think those uh, those news releases were part of the daily rhythm of uh, news coverage here at the White House, uh, something that uh, you're quite familiar with after being here for a while now. Okay. All right, Jim. Josh, um, you said that the President was not going to watch the debate mm -hmm. last night. 
Uh, does he have any general impressions of what he saw last night uh, in clips and the coverage and yeah. you know, what he read online? Yeah. Uh, presumably, I haven't talked to him about it, uh, to be candid with you, but um, I did have an opportunity to, to watch the debate, and I have to admit that uh, sort of watching the debate reminded me a little bit of a, a tough day at the airport. Um, um, when you saw a dozen, tell us how. well, you saw a dozen people in suits who were lined up in kiosks in front of a plane. They seemed angry, they seemed pessimistic, and they were looking for somebody to threaten. But they also stood there for three hours, so you can hardly blame them. But what we didn't see is we didn't see a lot of the sunny optimism that um, was typical of the president whose library they stood in. And we also didn't see a whole lot of commitment to the policies that were advanced by that president either. Instead, we saw what I might describe as an odd nostalgia for the George W. Bush era. This is an era that was characterized by a rush to war uh, and economic policies that nearly led us into a financial abyss, uh, only rivaling the scale of the Great Depression. Now, the fact is, is that when then-Senator Obama ran in 2007 and 2008, you had a situation where Osama bin Laden was still threatening Americans. Uh, you had an economy that was plunging toward a second Great Depression. Uh, and despite all of those uh, reasons to be concerned, this is a candidate who plastered hope on his yard signs. Uh, and he ended up winning that election. And he won re-election. Uh, and he's led our country back to have the safest, strongest economy in the world. Uh, so I think that's a testament to the idea uh, that having a, an optimistic, forward-looking, positive vision for the country isn't just a good political strategy. It turns out to be a good governing one, too. Uh, apparently, uh, all the Republican candidates for president at this point have a different strategy in mind. And, uh, and speaking of, uh, of one of those candidates, uh, Carly Fiorina came away with a lot of positive reviews for her, her performance. Uh, but one thing that she said during the debate is that she would not talk to Vladimir Putin. Uh, the president has spoken to President Putin on numerous occasions. Does that sound like a good strategy to the White House? Well, I, I don't want to turn the, uh, the White House briefing room into the post-debate spin room. Uh, but I will just say, uh, in general, that the president has made the case repeatedly that the interests of the United States are more effectively advanced around the world uh, through engagement. Uh, and you know, we tried a policy of isolation against Cuba for more than five decades that didn't yield very much. Uh, so the president is advocating a different strategy there and has implemented some policy changes according uh, to that philosophy. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, a similar effort to try to advance our interests uh, in preventing Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, we believe that that diplomatic agreement is the most effective way to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Many of our military leaders share that uh, assessment. And that was a diplomatic agreement that was only possible uh, by the United States and the President um, you know, leading a, uh, a strategy of engagement. So that, it, it is clear that this is an, an area of disagreement between uh, President Obama and many of the Republicans uh, on the stage last night. Uh, and I will say that this is, this is a worthy debate for us to have. Uh, so, um, you know, and I'm confident that over the course of the next uh, year or so, in advance of the general election, that there will be an ample opportunity to sort of consider uh, the merits of these arguments, and the American people uh, should do that as they contemplate uh, who the next president of the United States should be. And you may have spotted the segue, but has the president called Vladimir Putin yet? Uh, no, he has not. Not recently, at least. Is there any, I mean, is that something that you would like to see happen? Is that uh, something that might be forthcoming? Uh, sometimes you like to say, well, I well, wouldn't be surprised if... Yeah, uh, I think at this point what I would say is uh, uh, President Putin has made it clear that he's very interested in trying to sit down with the president, um, uh, but I don't have any uh, uh, additional meetings to, to tell you about at this point. And, and finally, on, on the uh, situation in Syria with, mm -hmm. with Russia um, and, and the overall difficulty that you talked about yesterday with respect to the, to the president's strategy for dealing with ISIS in Syria, the, the four to five... Uh, Syrian fighters that have been trained so far as part of that um, <coughs> policy. Does the president still have confidence in General Austin? Mm -hmm. of, of course he does. And I, I think it's important to uh, note, and I made a reference to this yesterday, General Austin, to his credit, 
sat before that, uh, that congressional committee, uh, you know, took the oath, faced the cameras, uh, and delivered some hard news uh, about the status of one aspect uh, of our strategy. Uh, and that is not a, uh, the kind of courageous stand that we've seen from those who have long advocated this kind of train and equip operation as the, essentially the silver bullet inside of Syria. The president has long been skeptical uh, of relying solely on this strategy. That's why he ha isn't, and our country isn't relying solely uh, on uh, that specific train and equip operation to lead our efforts uh, inside of Syria. The fact of the matter is the United States has provided uh, important material support uh, to Syrian opposition fighters, particularly those uh, Syrian Kurds and Syrian Arabs that are operating uh, in northern and northeastern Syria. Uh, they've made tremendous progress in driving ISIL out of thousands of square kilometers in, in northern Syria. Uh, there's a range of other support that the United States has provided, non-lethal support, uh, things like MREs and medical supplies that are critical to the ability of many of these fighting forces to uh, sustaining their efforts. Uh, that is on top of um, the ongoing military airstrike campaign that has advanced the efforts of many of those fighting forces on the ground. That is on top of the strategy that we've implemented to shut down financing for many of ISIL's uh, operations. That's on top of the strategy that the administration has put forward to target senior leaders in ISIL. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, high-profile members of ISIL that just in the last couple of months have been taken off the battlefield. Uh, that strategy is yielding some results. Uh, there is a coordinated... You can't be satisfied with $500 million for four or five ISIS fighters. Uh, of course not. I, I don't think anybody is, and that's exactly why General Austin indicated that... Have you communicated that to General Austin? Have they had any conversations where he's well, he said I, that's not acceptable? Yeah, I'm not going to get into any of the conversations between the, between the President and the, the Commander of, uh, of Central Command. Uh, but I will say that, the, that General Austin testified, again, to his credit, uh, before the cameras uh, in front of an open committee, uh, and indicating that some changes to that program were needed and that, uh, that he was going to uh, make some recommendations for, uh, for doing that. So, uh, but again, that is not what we have seen from uh, our critics who for years uh, criticized the President for not uh, pursuing this kind of approach uh, and suggested that that is actually the only thing we needed to do in order to solve all of our problems inside of Syria. Uh, so still waiting to hear from those individuals about um, what they believe we should do now. Okay, April. I want to go back to your, your equating um, of the GOP debate to a bad experience because we are experiencing an airport. Yeah. Isn't the FAA in I mean, they look like they had their flight canceled, didn't they? <laughs> They're all standing there in line, the waiting FAA, for their tickets, but the angry. FAA, but wouldn't the FAA oversee that, though? <laughs> <laughs> Some, some big multinational company was making them wait three hours before they could get their situation resolved. So what did you think about the attacks on the Obama administration when it came to not keeping this country safe mm -hmm. when, when they were talking about security and foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, a lot of those kinds of uh, attacks and charges don't, didn't really hold up to a lot of scrutiny. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into a, a situation, as I told Jim, and sort of go and get into a back and forth with those candidates. They'll have an opportunity to have that debate. And, um, so they certainly have uh, claims that they're entitled to make, uh, but many of those claims are not backed up by the actual facts. Now moving on to another subject, um, this is a big week um, in Washington for uh, Congressional Black Caucus members. Mm -hmm. Many of the administration uh, personnel are going over there to speak for various events. And I understand that Vice President Joe Biden is going Saturday night uh, to the Phoenix Awards as well as Hillary Clinton. Is there something that we should be reading into this that uh, Vice President Biden is going to the event when normally he does not go every year? Um, he's normally home on the weekends in Delaware. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not aware of uh, the specific plans for the Vice President's schedule over the weekend. Uh, you can check with his office. I wouldn't be surprised uh, to hear that he is attending the, uh, uh, the dinner. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if he attends regularly. I'm sure it's not the first time that he uh, has attended, if that's what his plans are. The President's certainly looking forward to the opportunity that he'll have to address the gathering uh, on Saturday evening. This, this, is a, uh, this is an event that the President uh, has spoken at frequently, particularly since he's been in office, and uh, he regularly looks forward to this opportunity. 
It's a member. And also, um, so as the president speaking about criminal justice Saturday, um, there was somewhat of a criminal justice type of meeting, we understand, here yesterday with um, grassroots leaders from Ferguson and Baltimore meeting with Valerie Jarrett. Could you talk about that meeting and, and why now? Mm -hmm. Well, April, this has been part of our, our ongoing efforts to meet with those activists who are, uh, who, who share the priority that this administration has placed on trying to improve trust uh, between law enforcement officers and the communities they're sworn to serve and protect. Uh, in many cases, these were advocates for uh, those uh, individuals who um, you know, have been victim, victims of police violence. Uh, and you know, many of these are individuals who are interested in trying to find a constructive solution. Uh, I would also note that, as is typical of our efforts, uh, the administration has also made a concerted effort to reach out to law enforcement and engage them in these kinds of conversations. I would note that the police chief of Philadelphia actually was the chair of the, or one of the co-chairs of the president's task force on 21st century policing. Uh, and today, uh, senior White House officials, including uh, Ms. Jarrett will be meeting with law enforcement officials uh, to talk about this issue as well. Um, and um, I would describe this as part of our ongoing efforts to continue to consult with those who are interested in this issue uh, as, uh, you know, as we try to leverage as much federal influence as we can uh, to try to address uh, this problem. So should we expect out of these continuing meetings some type of um, paperwork or something to come out saying this is what we ga we've gathered and this is what we need to implement further. Should we expect something like that? Well, there was a, a, there was a task force report that was issued earlier uh, this What's year. The task force report? I mean, yeah. is this something because they're also listening to what, what I understand from the meeting, they were going back telling Bar Valerie Jarrett things that they're still hearing on the ground. So this is beyond, beyond the task force. Is there something that could result or stem from the, these meetings? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I certainly wouldn't rule out the idea that there could be some, uh, you know, additional best practices or additional findings that um, uh, could be shared here. Uh, but the, the President long envisioned the creation of this task force to work quickly, to incorporate a variety of points of view, uh, and put forward some consensus recommendations about what can be done to try to improve the situation, or at least address the situation. And one of the most important things that they did was to put forward a, a good list of best practices uh, that draw upon the experience of local law enforcement officials and communities all across the country. By sharing these best practices, it can give uh, law enforcement leaders and other communities uh, some additional tools uh, for addressing some of these challenges. And, uh, you know, if uh, additional discussions yield uh, more common ground and more consensus about what additional best practices would look like, uh, we will not hesitate to share that. Thank you. Okay. Julie. Just following up on that, can you give us a, a little bit of an update on where things stand um, with the criminal justice reform legislation on the Hill and the push to get that going and to get a bipartisan deal on that, and whether any of the rhetoric from Republican presidential candidates linking crime to either President Obama's rhetoric or to the Black Lives Matter movement has in any way undermined the bipartisan um, sort of movement that was coalescing behind doing something on that in the short term. Is that still on track, or has that gotten derailed by some of the presidential campaign themes on this? Well, I, I, what's, uh, that's a good question. Let me, uh, let me answer it in a couple ways. I mean, the first thing that I would point out is that there, um, there were some candidates on the stage last night, even in the context of Republican primary, who indicated their support for some criminal justice reform measures. Uh, and I think that probably is um, a pretty powerful way for us to uh, evaluate the con continuing support on the Republican side of the aisle for some criminal justice reform measures. Uh, there has long been deep support on the Democratic side of the aisle for confronting some of these issues. Uh, and we've welcomed and even been complimentary of some Republicans with whom we don't often agree uh, about their support for some of these issues. Um, I mean, I, I'll be blunt, I don't think that there's been a lot of legislative work that's been done on this uh, over the last couple of months, uh, primarily because uh, Congress has been out of town for most of the last couple of months, and since they've gotten back, they've been bogged down in some of these issues related to uh, funding for Planned Parenthood. Uh, but I think that would be another reason that we're eager to see this budget situation resolved, because there, uh, 
there, this is, uh, I think, uh, a rich opportunity for bipartisan agreement uh, around a set of issues the President has long prioritized, and we're eager to get to, get to work on them. Now, there have been some conversations, uh, but, um, but, you know, the real uh, legislative hard work uh, and legislative negotiations uh, that need to take place uh, are still a little bit down the line. Down the line, how far? I mean, is it something that could get done this year, or just, does the President now see this as, you know, given the divide that's happened on the Iran deal, given the divide now over the budget and all the other items that they have to fight over this fall, that it's not going to get done now until? Well, I, I wouldn't set a timeline on it, but I, I don't think there's any – look, the President recognizes that he's got another uh, 15 months or so in office. so. Uh, there's a there's a particular sense of urgency around uh, many of these priorities, uh, particularly this one. Uh, so, um, you know, we're hopeful that we'll have an opportunity sooner rather than later uh, to try to start uh, uh, advancing this. Okay, Devin. Uh, speaking of urgency and priorities, I wanted to ask yeah. you about Gitmo. Uh, okay. The Pentagon today announced they have transferred uh, another detainee, their first in three months. Yep. Um, as you know, there's 115 left there. 56 of them have been cleared for release, but you just can't find a place to put them. Um, and I remember when the President tapped uh, Ash Carter, one of the, the buzz around him was that he was going to sort of expedite this and, 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 and clear those 56. Why is it still taking so long for those 56 that have already been cleared to get out of there and be place? Well, uh, Devin, the, the, um, the numbers that you have match with what I have here. Uh, right now there are 115 uh, detainees who remain at Guantanamo. Uh, it's not insignificant that since uh, uh, President Obama took office, we've transferred 123 uh, detainees uh, out of, of Gitmo. So that's an indication that we've made a lot of important progress. More than half of the detainees who were in Gitmo when the President took office have been transferred. So uh, that's an indication of the President's commitment to this. I think there are a variety of things that make this quite challenging. The first is we've seen a number of obstacles erected by Congress intentionally to make this more difficult. Uh, and Republicans and Democrats and some Democrats on Capitol Hill have been pretty candid about that. Uh, so one of the things that makes this difficult challenge much harder uh, is the kind of congressional interference that we've seen. The second thing is, uh, is that the President himself has set a high standard for ensuring that our national security interests are served by these transfers. Uh, the Secretary of Defense is responsible for certifying that appropriate measures have been taken to mitigate the risk to national security when, in, when any of these individuals is, uh, is transferred. Uh, and I know that Secretary Carter takes that responsibility quite seriously. Uh, there's also been a concerted diplomatic effort uh, on the part of State Department officials uh, to work with our partners and allies around the world uh, to find an appropriate uh, way to, um, to transfer these individuals. And so why, why that work is ongoing not been more fruitful? Is that, is it a failure of diplomacy? Is it a difficulty in, in, in working with some of our partners to take those 56 that have been cleared, yeah. but not? Well, uh, Devin, I, I think there's a, for a lot of these other countries, there's not a lot of upside to taking a, a Gitmo detainee, right? In, that, in fact, that's why the Bush administration tried to sidestep this issue from the very beginning and open up this prison uh, several years ago because they didn't know where to put them. Uh, and I think that is, you know, further explained by Congress passing legislation that uh, effectively prevents any of their transfers to the United States. So it's not surprising that it, uh, it takes, uh, it's more than, it requires more than one conversation uh, to convince uh, another country to, um, uh, to accept custody uh, of these individuals. That said, the reason, so then you're asking yourself, why does any country uh, accept uh, these individuals. Uh, uh, and the reason for that is that they share the goal of the administration uh, of closing the prison. And these are, in, they, these are countries, the leaders of these countries understand uh, that the prison at Guantanamo Bay and its continued operation does serve to effectively uh, uh, benefit uh, extremist recruiters, that they hold up the prison at Guantanamo Bay as a reason uh, that people should radicalize and join this uh, uh, the, their cause. And just one more on the, on the domestic political side from this podium three months ago you said that you were in the final stages of, of drafting this plan that was going to, again your words, going to short circuit some of the GOP mm -hmm. opposition on this. Mm -hmm. is, is there any update on, on where that plan is or what, what it would be? Uh, this is a plan that continues to be under development uh, since we last talked about this. The uh, officials at the Department of Defense uh, have made uh, site visits to a couple of uh, facilities inside the United States 
to evaluate how those facilities may fit into our broader plans. Uh, so there is work that is actively being done uh, on this, and um, you know, we're hopeful that we can finally see some constructive engagement from members of Congress uh, to accomplish a goal the President set out uh, to achieve uh, more than six years ago, and that's to uh, finally close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Okay. Margaret. Um, on that same note, uh, is the President still confident that he can close Guantanamo Bay before he leaves office? Well, he's sure going to try. Uh, and I, I think that you know, today's announcement is an indication that uh, while a lot of this difficult diplomatic and national security work uh, takes place behind the scenes, uh, that this is something that the President has made clear to his team they need to remain focused on. Uh, and again, the fact that we've transferred 123 detainees, uh, and that, that's, that's more than half uh, of the detainees who were in custody when the President took office, is uh, an indication of the dogged effort that's taking place, again, mostly behind the scenes. Uh, to try to accomplish what the President has laid out as a significant national security goal, which is closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay. I, I want to follow up on one of the answers you gave. Can you just clarify, do you see the bottleneck here as the problem being with diplomacy or with the certification process? Because there have been countries lined up to take some of these detainees, but yeah. uh, SECDEF hasn't signed off on yeah. all of them. Well, I, I think the chief bottleneck is Congress. Uh, that's true in a lot of areas. It's true in this one as well. We have seen Congress pass legislation that they put in place intentionally and too specifically make closing the prison at Guantanamo Bay much more difficult. Uh, that's unfortunate, uh, but it's the situation that we're dealing with. That is the chief bottleneck. Um, but again, I, I think I was pretty uh, direct in answering Devin's question that there are uh, significant national security considerations to make when considering these transfers. Uh, the President holds those as high priorities, uh, and it's the responsibility of the Secretary of Defense to dig into the details of the arrangements that we um, reach with other countries to uh, uh, adequately mitigate uh, any threat to uh, our national security that these transfer detainees may pose. Uh, and yes, it's a difficult diplomatic conversation uh, to make the case to another country that, um, uh, that, they, that they should uh, bring these individuals inside their borders. Uh, so uh, that's difficult diplomatic work, too. Uh, but none of that is enhanced uh, by, uh, you know, by a, you know, what has been an a obstructive or an obstructionist policy that's been pursued by Congress. And do you have a timeline on when a plan is going to be submitted to Congress? Uh, I don't have a timeline at this point. This is something that we've uh, been working on for a few months now. And um, uh, I would anticipate that uh, you know, once we've gotten that plan, maybe not finalized, but at least in a condition where it can be shared with uh, members of Congress, we'll be in a position to at least uh, talk about it a little bit more with all of you. Quick question on Russia. Um, apart from the Putin-POTUS possible meeting there, um, this proposal from the Russians to have a military mil military conversation, uh, where is the White House on that? And is there concern that having military chiefs, defense chiefs, uh, sit down together would at least give the appearance of collusion uh, between the U.S. and Russia? Well, uh, first, Margaret, the fact is, and we've said this many times, but uh, in the context of this question, I think it bears repeating. There's no military solution to the turmoil that plagues Syria right now. Uh, the, the solution to this lies in advancing the kind of political uh, agreement that would transfer uh, Assad out of power uh, and put in power a government inside of Syria that has the confidence uh, and reflects the will of the Syrian people. Uh, that's where, that's the, that's the root of this. Um, as you know, uh, and as you've closely covered, the significant military-to-military -military cooperation between the United States and Russia was, uh, was deeply affected uh, by Russia's decisions to try to annex Crimea and engage in a variety of destabilizing actions using their military uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, so you know, we've made clear that uh, Russia's military actions uh, inside of Syria, uh, if they are used to prop up the Assad regime, uh, would be destabilizing and counterproductive. Uh, that propping up a, an agree uh, a regime that's uh, losing its grip on power in many cases only has the effect of driving more Syrian citizens uh, into the, uh, the arms of extremists. Um, 
Now, that all being said, uh, we have long indicated, and I've been saying this uh, quite a bit over the last couple of days, we would welcome constructive uh, contributions from the Russians to the uh, anti-ISIL uh, coalition. Um, so that's why we'll remain open to tactical, practical discussions with the Russians uh, in order to further the goals of the counter-ISIL coalition uh, and to ensure the safe conduct uh, of coalition operations. On that, sorry, the proposal from the Russians, the word deconflict was used there. That's sort of suggesting that if the U.S. coalition forces and the Russians are acting in the same space, Syria, that there could be concern of being, uh, you know, in conflict with each other, sure. even inadvertently. That's right. So when you say you're open to tactical, practical conversations, does that include this proposal from the Russians to sit down and say? let's not be at odds here, even if we don't have the same ends in our intervention. Well, again, I, I think we would use any venue that we had uh, to reiterate to the Russians the things that I start out here, that there's no military solution, that we continue to have significant concerns with the conduct of their military uh, in Ukraine, uh, and we would warn them against doubling down on their support for the Assad regime. That's a losing bet. It's a losing bet for Russia. It's a losing bet for Syria. Uh, and it's a losing bet for our efforts to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, but uh, we do have some of the concerns that you just described, uh, and that's why um, you know, we'll remain open to what I would describe as tactical, practical discussions with the Russians. Um, and those discussions would be focused on furthering the goals of our counter-ISIL coalition uh, and ensuring uh, the safe conduct of anti-ISIL coalition operations. Okay. Kevin. Josh, thanks. I just want to sort of follow up very quickly on Margaret's question. You said earlier that uh, you mentioned that Syria has a responsibility not to interfere with U.S. operations in Syria. Does that also apply to the Russians? They have a responsibility to not interfere with U.S. operations in Syria. Well, Kevin, I think what it is is that we've made clear to the Syrians that they shouldn't interfere with our military activities uh, inside of Syria. And when I say our, I mean our coalitions. Uh, anti-ISIL uh, efforts that are focused on degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL. Uh, when it comes to the Russians, uh, you know, we obviously would welcome their uh, constructive contribution uh, to that effort, uh, and um, you know, and we'll we'll be open to uh, the kind of tactical, practical discussions that may be needed uh, to try to uh, advance our uh, anti-ISIL goals uh, and to ensure the safe conduct of anti-ISIL coalition operations. Does the White House view Russia's activities in Syria as a provocation? Well, we certainly would view Russian activities in support of the Assad regime as destabilizing and counterproductive. We've made that clear uh, in private from uh, in the midst of conversations between Secretary Kerry uh, and Foreign Minister Lavrov. I think they've spoken now three times in the last uh, week or so. Uh, in each conversation, uh, Secretary Kerry has made clear uh, our view on that. Um, and obviously, that's something that we've discussed uh, at some length publicly as well. Uh, so, you know, but ultimately, um, you know, and the reason, uh, well, let me explain the reason for that. We believe that further propping up uh, the Assad regime uh, only serves to double down on a losing bet. Uh, the Assad regime uh, is, um, has lost significant territory in the last several years. Uh, they are isolated, uh, or largely isolated, from the broader international community. Uh, and, uh, you know, efforts to prop them up uh, only makes the priorities of our counter-ISIL campaign more difficult to achieve. Is it difficult, though, to sort of suspend what you're seeing? It seems like Russia is propping up the Assad regime. So White House not see that, or do you not view it that way? Well, I think at this point it's, um, and I've, I've been pretty candid about this in the past too, uh, it's difficult to discern exactly what their most important priority is. Uh, you know, the, the Russians have even said some uh, conflicting things in public about what their uh, exact intentions are. So uh, that's why we're trying to be as clear and direct as we can about what our intentions are and what our priorities are. Uh, and, again, we've made those intentions known both uh, in public and in private, uh, and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no misunderstanding them uh, in Moscow. Thanks. Okay. 
Chris. Just a couple things about the debate last night since you did watch it. And um, the numbers just came out on uh, the viewership. It was early numbers, 22.9 million, just below what the Fox debate was. Obviously, uh, a tremendous amount of interest, and um, most people would have a similar take on why that is. But uh, are you surprised that there's that much interest this early in the campaign? Uh, and does it argue for those who have been trying to um, tell Debbie Wasserman Schultz and, and the Democrats that maybe they should consider more debates, that, you know, more eyeballs, more chances to get their message out there might be a good idea? Well, uh, again, I, I'm not sure that the, uh, that the Republican prospects in the general election in 2016 were enhanced by a large viewing audience last night. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they saw a lot of, you know, angry, pessimistic, uh, threatening people on their screen yesterday. Now, again, these were individuals who were standing in line for three hours, so you can understand why that, um, to borrow a word, that, that, that their persona might look like that. Uh, but, you know, the fact is there will be an opportunity for us to have a very robust discussion in this country about the best way for us to capitalize uh, on the really important progress that uh, our country has made over the last uh, six or seven years. Uh, there are, there's a tremendous opportunity waiting the next President of the United States. Now, the United States uh, and our influence around the world uh, is quite strong, uh, and there are a variety of ways to measure that, whether it's the success that President Obama had in building uh, a coalition of more than 60 nations to uh, degrade and ultimately destroy uh, ISIL. There's a lot of skepticism in this room, understandably so, about how broad that coalition would be, but there's no arguing uh, about the success of those diplomatic efforts. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about how the international community, when it came to confronting Iran over their nuclear program, uh, was going in a thousand different directions, uh, struggling to know exactly what should be done in the face of a quickly advancing nuclear program inside of Iran. Uh, the President demonstrated some leadership on the international scale uh, and built, uh, you know, essentially led international unity uh, around a strategy that applied tough sanctions on Iran, confronted them over the nuclear program, received significant concessions from Iran uh, in terms of the constraints that they would apply to their nuclear program and the kind of inspections that they would submit to to verify their, uh, their compliance with the agreement. Um, that has uh, strengthened the hand of the United States uh, in the international community. Uh, to say nothing of the long list of statistics I could recite about the, uh, the inherent strength of our economy, our economy right now is the envy of the world. Uh, and again, I think uh, the, the, the way that our economy has bounced back uh, is primarily a testament to the grit and determination and inventiveness of American workers and American entrepreneurs. Uh, but those efforts were significantly enhanced uh, by difficult policy decisions that this uh, president made in the earliest days of his presidency. Uh, and whether that's the Recovery Act uh, or rescuing the auto industry, uh, we've got a heck of a lot to show for it. And what that means is it means that the next President of the United States will be very well positioned to lead uh, the country uh, into the future. Uh, and the risk associated with that, however, is that by reverting back to the policies that were championed uh, by the previous administration, we, uh, those gains are tenuous. Uh, and we could be in a situation where um, you know, we pay an economic price for going back and pursuing those failed economic policies, particularly the middle class. Uh, and so that's why the President feels like he's got such a big stake in this election, uh, and that's why he would welcome uh, every opportunity to have a robust public debate about the future of the country. Well, then, to go back to my original question and the, the um, arguments that you just made that presumably some Democratic candidates might make, uh, given the opportunity, does it make sense for them to consider more debates, more opportunities to get the message you just articulated out to a, a, our audience of millions? Well, I, I, the, the view of the President is, is that, uh, that debates are important, uh, and they certainly do attract attention. And, um, and you know, I know that the DNC has announced that they would have uh, six debates uh, among all the candidates. Uh, the President has not taken a position about the appropriate number uh, of debates, uh, other than his view that he believes that uh, they should have them. Uh, and he's pleased to see that they'll do that. And uh, that'll be, you know, in contrast to the Republicans that I don't think will be well served or have been well served by uh, the debates that have drawn a, a large viewing audience. Uh, I do think that the opportunity that Democratic, Democratic candidates will have as early as next month uh, to engage in the debate about the priorities and values of this party. Uh, I think will be quite good for our prospects in the general election next year.
uh, since you saw the debate, you know that your boss was mentioned more than a few times. Mm -hmm. And let me just ask you about one particular instance since it has been cited, I think both by more liberal and more conservative pundits as one of the uh, big moments of the night, and it was for Carly Fiorina, who dared Hillary Clinton and the President to watch the Planned Parenthood tapes, obviously uh, the extra significance given um, the, the budget battle. And she said it, uh, they should send a message because this is about a, the character of our nation. And I wonder if you have any reaction. I don't have a spe specific reaction to, to her comments. I mean, I think we've been quite clear about uh, the fact that Planned Parenthood did offer an apology uh, about the comments that were made in the context of those videos. Uh, it certainly was appropriate for them to do so. Uh, the comments that were made in those videos were, uh, were shocking. Uh, presumably that's why those, uh, uh, those videos were released. Uh, so the President believes that was an, uh, an appropriate thing for Planned Parenthood to do. Uh, but he does not believe it would be appropriate for Republicans to follow through on the promise that they have made to shut down the government uh, over funding for Planned Parenthood. And the fact of the matter is, and this bears, I know everybody in this room I think knows this, but it bears repeating, the fact of the matter is federal funding is not allowed to be used for abortions. That's the federal law. Uh, that's a law that this administration has enforced. Uh, and um, that's why when Republicans suggest they should shut off funding for Planned Parenthood, the only thing that they're doing is proposing to cut off access to health care that millions of Americans rely on. Do you think that the conversations that were had last night, the reaction in that room, uh, and some of the reaction that we've heard since then to that argument and others who made similar arguments about Planned Parenthood uh, and about defunding, uh, will have an impact on the budget process? Do you think it's brought the conversation more broadly? Did you listen yeah. to it last night and say, this could make it harder for there to be a budget deal? Yeah. Well, look, I, I think that uh, are you referring specifically to this question of Planned Parenthood or the, or the active debate in the Republican presidential primary well, I'm on it? I'm just saying that there's an active debate, but this certainly shone a spotlight on it in a very mm -hmm. huge way last yeah. night. Well, again, yeah. I, I, was, I, I took note of the fact that the preponderance of candidates on that stage last night advocated for shutting down the federal government just to prevent millions of families in this country from getting access to health care. That is the effective impact of the policy that they're advocating. Uh, and people should understand that. And 22.9 million viewers who watch CNN now, I think, do. Uh, and that is certainly not an approach that the President supports. Uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, what's that? No, you're welcome for the plug. Uh, but uh, that certainly is not a, a, a policy or an approach that the President supports. And the way that Republicans, including some Republican candidates, have injected this ideological issue into the midst of the uh, budget debate has made it more difficult to reach a bipartisan budget agreement and does have consequences for the ability of the Congress to, to reach a budget, uh, or to reach a budget agreement, uh, which also has significant consequences for our economy. So uh, you heard the President yesterday, particularly in the, in the context of a volatile economic markets around the world, volatile financial markets around the world, uh, it doesn't make sense for Congress to be adding this uh, volatility uh, into the economy uh, so unnecessarily. Uh, and uh, the President is, is hopeful that, uh, that this will be uh, one of those rare instances in which common sense will actually prevail on Capitol Hill. Okay. Cheryl. Thanks. To, to sort of follow up on government shutdown, it seems we're talking about them every year now. Does the President now see the threat of a government shutdown as routine? And what kind of effect does this have, particularly on the federal workforce. Yeah. Well, Cheryl, uh, let me start by saying that we didn't have this brinksmanship last year, primarily because uh, in the aftermath of the last government shutdown that was engineered by Republicans, Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill sat down and hammered out a two-year budget agreement. That ended up being good for our economy. That was an important way that Congress could support uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, and the private sector. And we encourage them to do that again. It doesn't mean that they yield a, yielded a perfect product uh, or a piece of legislation that was uh, beloved by anybody in either party. Uh, it's not the kind of uh, legislation um, for which they will erect a, a, a specific wing of the Barack Obama Presidential Library. But it is a notable achievement in that it reflected bipartisan compromise uh, and it adequately funded our economic and national security priorities. 
uh, and it prevented this damaging debate uh, and avoided the unnecessary risk of a potential government shutdown. Uh, but two years after the last Republican engineered government shutdown, uh, unfortunately, we seem to be careening toward another one, also engineered by Republicans. Uh, so uh, that's bad for the economy. Uh, and I do think it does have an impact on the mindset of the federal workforce. Uh, and um, you know, that's one of the many, many consequences uh, of this kind of um, you know, irresponsible uh, gamesmanship that we've seen from Republicans on Capitol Hill. Um, and it needs to stop. Just to follow up, though, on the, on the impact, I mean, does it really, does the continued threats of government shutdowns undermine the public confidence in government? Does it hurt productivity and morale? Does it undermine our standing on the global stage? I've just heard you talk about how strong the United States is now yeah. on the global stage, but yet it's like another government shutdown. Right. It surely doesn't help any of that. Uh, and again, if we're in a situation where Congress wants to try to find a way to play a constructive role for a change, simply doing, fulfilling their most basic responsibility in some ways is a really important way for them to do that. Congress was entrusted by our founding fathers with significant power. Uh, and the most significant of those powers was the power of the purse uh, and the ability to pass a budget uh, and essentially the requirement to pass a budget to allow the, fun the federal government to function. Uh, so uh, we'll hopeful, we're hopeful that they'll live up to that responsibility. And uh, certainly the last thing that the U.S. economy needs uh, is the unnecessary injection of even more volatility uh, into the U.S. economy. Right. Tolu. Uh, there was apparently a military coup in Burkina Faso. I'm wondering if the White House has a response to that. I do have a little something on this. Uh, the United States is deeply concerned about the unfolding events in Burkina Faso. Uh, we call for the immediate release of all officials that are being held there. The United States strongly condemns any attempt to seize power through extra-constitutional means um, or resolve internal political disagreements using force. Uh, the United States calls for an end. Uh, I'm sorry. The United States calls for an immediate end to violence. Uh, urges the military personnel involved to return to their barracks, and reaffirms our steadfast support for the civilian transitional government to continue its work of preparing for free, fair, and credible elections that are, that are scheduled for October 11th. Well, I also wanted to ask about the video that the, I guess the President starred in or did a voiceover for earlier today about citizen, citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you know, that video sort of timed to the morning after the, the debate um, and earlier comments by the President saying anti-immigrant rhetoric is uh, un-American and what we heard from Joe Biden saying that Trump's comments were sick. I'm wondering if there's sort of a concerted effort by the White House to um, promote citizenship and, and <coughs> pro-immigrant uh, language at a time when we're seeing um, Donald Trump and sort of um, some Republicans who have, uh, have, have expressed different thoughts um, get a lot of support from the, uh, from the voters on the Republican side. Well, Tolu, the video is released today to mark Citizenship Day. Uh, and it was an opportunity for the White House to unveil the Stand Stronger Citizenship Awareness Campaign, uh, which is a project that we've engaged in with a nonprofit called Civic Nation. Uh, and the goal is to encourage eligible immigrants to take an important step in their American journey and commit to American citizenship. Uh, so to launch this effort, the President released a video message that can be found at committocitizenship.org. Uh, overall, the initiative is focused on encouraging the 8.8 .8 million legal immigrants, uh, legal permanent residents uh, to the United States that qualify for citizenship to learn more about the naturalization process uh, so that they can solidify their roots here in the United States and tap into the incredible opportunities that await new American citizens. Uh, it also bears mentioning at this point that the United States also has a path uh, to citizenship for refugees. Uh, and we've talked a lot about uh, the status of refugees uh, uh, over the last several weeks. Uh, I believe that the number is 370,000 uh, refugees uh, that have been, uh, uh, that have uh, uh, gotten citizenship uh, since uh, 2009 when the President took office. And again, these refugees are individuals who are classified as refugees by the United Nations. They have a very specific status. Uh, and the United, take, United States takes in more uh, of these individuals with a specific UN-designated refugee status than every other nation in the world combined. Uh, and those refugees are afforded some important benefits, including the opportunity 
uh, to get citizenship here in the United States. So uh, it's a very particular path. It's a very specific one. But it does reflect uh, the kind of opportunity uh, that awaits uh, refugees, and it reflects the uh, kind of opportunities that the, the United States is willing to uh, give to those who go through um, uh, this legal process of becoming either a legal permanent resident uh, or going through this uh, UN-administered refugee process. If I can just follow up on the earlier question about the oil uh, export ban. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the White House position is, is crystal clear, but in the past you've sort of um, said that this is a decision that's um, housed at the Commerce Department. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if kind of you can go a little bit beyond that to talk about whether or not the White House is actually studying this issue, um, whether or not the Commerce Department, Department, which is under the White House, is um, in conversations with you. Do you have a broader philo philosophical um, position on the crude export ban itself, um, more than just sort of saying this is something that the Commerce Department is, uh, is in charge of? Well, it's a clever way to ask the question. Uh, the, the, our crystal clear position uh, is in opposition to the legislation that's currently being com uh, contemplated by Congress right now. Uh, the fact is this is a policy decision that's made uh, at the Commerce Department. I would allow that there uh, is a view uh, at the White House, uh, but um, uh, I'm not prepared to engage in the, that philosophical conversation uh, from the podium today. Okay? I'm sorry? Why not? <laughs> well, um, I know that particularly uh, readers of Bloomberg are uh, well aware of the market sensitivities associated with these kinds of deliberations, uh, or uh, the fact that these deliberations may even be taking place, which I'm not in a position to confirm from here. So um, that's why I've uh, been quite circumspect, maybe even uncharacteristically circumspect in uh, discussing this particular issue. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Scott. Is it fair to say that you're crystal clear against this particular bill? That's correct. You're not necessarily crystal clear against another bill that would lift the ban on oil? I mean, is it something about this bill in particular beyond the basic fact of lifting the ban on oil? Uh, well, the, uh, we, are, uh, we are opposed to this bill. Uh, and the reason that we oppose the bill is because this is a decision that actually can be made uh, and should be made, in our view, by the Commerce Department. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jurisdictional. It doesn't require an act of Congress to make this policy decision. So we believe that uh, the Commerce Department has access to all the expertise and information that they need uh, 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 to set this policy. Okay. Uh, let's move around. Francesca. Uh, I've been made aware that the list of attendees for the, the Pope's visit, the reception that's being had, hasn't been released yet, but uh, a news organization today reported that among the list of guests there would be a pro-choice nun, a transgender woman, and an openly gay Episcopal bishop. And I was wondering if the White House is trying to send um, a message or make a statement with the invitees at that reception. Uh, Francesca, I have not seen the news report that you're referring to. I think it's important for uh, all of you to, uh, as you consider chasing that report, to know that there will be, uh, I believe the number is about 15,000 people uh, who will be on the south lawn of the White House. Uh, so this obviously, or in the vicinity uh, of the White House, to, um, to participate in those uh, ceremonies welcoming the Pope uh, to Washington. Um, so uh, we'll have more information on the guest list uh, once I can actually confirm for myself who's on it. Uh, but I think that's why I would uh, warn you against drawing uh, a lot of conclusions about one or two or maybe even three people who may be on the guest list uh, because there will be um, 15,000 other people there too. Sure, I'm just making sure that there's also not some sort of, you know, other reception that's taking place, like a private reception. Maybe they would be at not necessarily, you know, on the open lawn yeah. thing that you're talking about where 15,000 people would be at. Uh, we'll have more information about the exact itinerary uh, for the Pope um, early next week. Okay. okay. Fifteen thousand right. here. Uh, yes, yeah, sort of uh, on the South Lawn and uh, in the uh, on the ellipse and things. So, uh, it's why you may have noticed that the Office of Personal Management has encouraged uh, federal workers, at least on that day, uh, to take advantage of telecommuting policies that may be in place at their agency. Uh, traffic's going to be a mess. <laughs> Steve. Yeah. Um, on back to Planned Parenthood. Um, I'm wondering, is, is the White House, will the White House be interested or willing to consider a potential compromise that would uh, fall short of defunding Planned Parenthood, which, which you've made absolutely clear is off the table, would be vetoed? 
Uh, there are proposals that would address the specific issue in these tapes, which is money changing hands for fetal body parts from aborted fetuses. And uh, there's a proposal in the House uh, by Kevin Yoder that would say uh, you couldn't change, you couldn't get any expenses paid for, you couldn't get a check in your account if your Planned Parenthood were to another clinic. Is that the sort of thing that maybe this uh, could resolve this fight short of a shutdown that the White House would be interested in potentially trying to negotiate? Well, uh, Steve, I haven't seen any of those, uh, or at least that one proposal that you've uh, noted there. So I would, uh, I'm reluctant to weigh in on it one way or the other, or even indicate our willingness to consider it. I think we've been pretty direct about what our concerns are. Uh, and those concerns center on uh, the fact that there is already federal law in place that's enforced by this administration that prevents uh, any organization uh, from using federal funds to perform abortions. It's against the law. Uh, it's a law that this administration enforces. That's why the effect of the policy that's being advanced by Republicans does nothing more uh, than take away health care access uh, for millions of families all across the country. And that's why the President uh, is vehemently supposed, uh, opposed to it. That's why, uh, I, will, I guess I'll also point out, this is not the first time uh, that the President has opposed a Republican effort uh, to take health care away from people. Uh, I'm not really sure what the Republican fascination is uh, with taking health care away from millions of American families, uh, but it's not something the President's going to go along with. You don't have a position at this point on whether the President would veto an effort to prohibit anybody from getting a check in return for a body part. I just don't know that that, uh, uh, what I'm saying is I don't know that the administration has considered that specific proposal from, uh, from Mr. Yoder. Uh, back to Guantanamo, mm -hmm. uh, Senator McCain, who I know the President called this spring to try and <coughs> set the stage for a compromise on this. Uh, Senator McCain's telling reporters today that he needs to see a specific plan from the White House, a plan for where these detainees are going to go, an actual specific site uh, if they're going to be brought to the United States, and uh, and not just you know sort of a range menu of options. Uh, in addition to you know you haven't had a timeline yet. But you're facing a, a, a deadline with the defense authorization bill. The president's threatened to veto over this issue, and, and McCain says he can't go to his colleagues and, and get them to vote for something that you want until he has that. Is that some that urgency, that sense of urgency? Uh, known in the White House? Do they uh, understand where McCain's at here? Well, Senator McCain is one of the one of those in Congress that, uh, depending on the day you ask him, uh, does indicate a willingness to work with us constructively uh, to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. And so uh, it appears that today might have been one of those days. Uh, so uh, I think what you would uh, see from the administration is a desire to uh, engage him. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, I would just point out that, uh, as I mentioned in uh, answering an earlier question, that the administration has been doing site surveys of specific locations, uh, and I think that should give you an indication that the administration is taking the formulation of this plan quite seriously uh, and is interested in how the details of that plan would work. Uh, I don't want to prejudge at this point exactly what form uh, a presentation like that would take. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of uh, uh, you know, any proposals that they may have to offer in terms of what those details look like. Uh, but the uh, interest that Senator McCain is showing today uh, in cooperating with the administration on this national security priority uh, is one that we take seriously. Uh, and I think that's why you have seen uh, us seek to engage him uh, in a spirit of cooperation and respect to try to advance that mm -hmm. measure. Uh, so. There is hard work being done uh, on this, and uh, I mean, I think quite frankly, uh, I'll be in a position to speak a little bit more uh, about the details of this plan uh, once something has been sent up to Capitol Hill. Well, he's also threatened uh, if the president uh, and his veto threat stand, um, he's also threatened to start blocking civilian nominees mm -hmm. through the Senate. Because mm -hmm. um, they're just speeding through right now, just, I mean, just sailing through. It's well, hard to keep track of all of them, isn't it? I'm just saying that, that you know, this yeah. is starting to escalate. Yeah. You're coming up here at the end of the year. About it, though. I mean, there, there, we saw all kinds of roadblocks with our nominees all the time. So, you know, I, I, that's not something that we'd be particularly concerned about. Okay.
Dave, I'll give you the last one. Thanks, Josh. Back on Syria, um, a year ago, the president said he wanted to train and equip 15,000 opposition fighters to defeat ISIL. Mm -hmm. and I quote him saying, we must strengthen the opposition as the best counterweight to extremists. Does the president still believe that? Well, I think, Dave, the, I mean, obviously the, uh, the specific train and equip uh, program that the Department of Defense has been working to implement uh, over the last year or so has fallen uh, far short of that goal. Uh, we knew at the beginning, and the President knew when he uttered those words, how difficult of a challenge uh, this standing up this proposal and implementing this proposal would be. Uh, I think in fairness to the President, I don't, I don't think he contemplated uh, those 15,000 uh, Syrian opposition fighters being trained and equipped uh, and fighting all within the space of one year. Uh, but what I will say is that there is um, – that General Austin has made clear that he's going to uh, consider changes to the program and to, to try to determine uh, what kinds of changes can be made to yield uh, much better results. Uh, the other thing that the administration has sought to do is to uh, offer greater support to those Syrian opposition fighters that are already fighting. Uh, and there is uh, significant support that the United States and our coalition partners have offered to uh, Syrian Kurds in particular, who have been effective in driving ISIL out of some areas of northern and northeastern Syria. Uh, you know, we are in a place where we have nearly um, shut off ISIL's access to uh, the border with Turkey. This is a, a border that's nearly 600 miles long. Uh, and they only have a narrow corridor now in, in which to operate, and we're seeking to, to close that. That is thanks primarily to the uh, efforts of those Syrian opposition fighters that are being backed uh, by coalition military airstrikes. Uh, and those fighters have also benefited from um, material support uh, by the United States and our coalition partners as well. So that's just one example of how we have been able to deepen our cooperation with uh, fighters on the ground in Syria in a way that has advanced uh, our goal to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And in, in July, Secretary Carter said to that point we had trained and equipped about 60 Syrian fighters, and now we have four or five. Is it fair to say the President is discouraged by that direction? Well, I think it's fair for you to say that the, the, the President um, uh, uh, believes that the program needs to operate at a, uh, at a higher, much higher level. Uh, and that's why General Austin is considering a range of changes to the program. For the kinds of uh, changes they're considering, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. They may or may not be able to tell you about some of those uh, plans. Uh, but the President certainly has much higher expectations for the program. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Josh, did you see the Fed news? I, didn't, I didn't. Are they reading the rates unchanged? Or is the White House going to have a comment on that? Uh, uh, I doubt it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you.